this week's episode, we talk about stir fry and interview Chef Jeff Ang of Tower Oaks Lodge in Rockville, Maryland. Once again to Punk Rock Foodies Radio, coming at you live from downtown Mattersville at the Vicious Pig Saloon. This is your one-stop shop for everything punk rock and food. And now, your hosts, Steve Guerrero, Skate Rat Betty, Brian Reinhardt, and the asshole in charge, Xander T. And that was The Wood by Bad Cop, Bad Cop, and you are listening to Punk Rock Foodies Radio for some reason. And I am Xander T, the asshole in charge of Punk Rock Foodies, and with me today at the Vicious Pig Saloon is... What's up, Steve Guerrero. And uh, Brian Reinhardt. And Skate Rat Betty is not with us today because she is on maternity leave. She procreated. Yeah. yeah. Little Barson yeah. came on, uh, what was it, the uh, 16th of July? Yeah. And uh, Little about Penelope. 8.30 in the morning. Nine pounds, or no, not nine pounds. No, shit. <laughs> much, much smaller, yeah. Yeah, yeah. four Nine four ounces pounds. or something yeah. like that. Some She's like that. fucking adorable. She was, Skate Rab was posting pictures with little Penelope on like a UV lamp, just kind of chilling. And I'm just like, look, this kid is already <laughs> fucking spoiled, man. She's basically Beyonce at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting in a tanning bed, and she lives in fucking Florida. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but since Skate Rat isn't here, we brought in a, uh, a guest host. Um, it's my little brother, Eli. Say hi, Eli. Hi, Eli. <laughs> there he is. Very <laughs> Yeah. So you may have seen Eli's posted a few times on Punk Rock Foodies. Um, mostly, mostly dick pics. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, try, I, I try to post, but uh, I take the pictures and I usually forget. So, yeah. <laughs> well, drinking will do that. <laughs> you came to the right place. And the food's just so good. You know, the food's just so good. I gotta, I gotta get to it when I can. You know, <laughs> I get distracted. 
I hear you many times. I've almost taken a picture of an empty plate because I forgot to even take the picture at the start. I've done that. Yep. So, uh, Pug Rock Foodies is a Facebook group on Facebook. Yep. We're Make no food. longer on MySpace. No longer. We f- they finally cut us off. Really? Not quite. We're not quite on Food Network yet, but we're getting close. I, I have a feeling. No. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's funny that you mentioned Food Network because of our guest today. And, and actually, Eli here, I've got, we'll talk about it later. But, um, yeah, we are on the Facebook. And you make food, you post a picture of your food. It's that simple. We like to look at your food. You can look at our food. We like to hear how you made it, if possible. And what you know, in how you fucked it up. Yes. If you followed a recipe and fucked up, we'd like to hear that too. Let's Brian hear your mistakes. Really likes to hear that. Oh yeah. But but make sure it's in the collage app. Yes. Yes. If possible. It's got a collage. Did you see that collage recently? It was the exact same fucking picture three times in the collage. Yeah, she like wanted to show off every angle or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did not see that. <laughs> That's a waste of time. <laughs> But anyway, so yeah, we uh, love food, but we love punk rock music. And so we're going to listen to a little punk rock music, and then we're going to get into the show. So, Well, this past weekend, uh, uh, Jen's Baby was the only thing that came out. Uh, the also new gutter mouth came out. So let's listen to Made in the Shade here on Punk Rock Foodies Radio. Let's go. Woo! I'm not gonna be 
All right, and that was the implants with bleeding within. I like his. I like your radio voice. <laughs> <laughs> it's better than <laughs> yours. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. So Eli's with us instead of Skate Rack is the baby, and uh, you're listening to Punk Rock Foodies Radio. And today we are talking about the GOP convention tonight, and Scott Bayo. Scott Bayo is giving the invitation. Scott Willie Ames, Aaron Moran. Fucking Chachi, man. <laughs> I want Chachi in charge of me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what are we, what are we actually talking about this week? Well, okay, I was debating about it because we're okay. We have a great interview tonight. Um, we have uh, Chef Jeff Ang. Uh, he's one of the foodie members. He's yeah. a chef at uh, Tower Oaks uh, Lodge in Rockville, Maryland. And I, we were talking. Steve had said something about doing stir fry. Talking about stir fry, but Jeff's Asian. So would this be racist if we talked about stir fry today and then be an Asian guy? Like, I think it would be racist not to have an Asian guy. If we're talking about kung fu, and that was it. Then maybe it might be racist. <laughs> Well, I, I thought we talked Mexican food and then interviewed uh, Jaime uh, Calacas and uh, Elvis Cortez, so I guess... This show is so well-known for its racism. This is, this is a well-known <laughs> racist show. It's, it's progressive multiculturalism, Brian. That's what we, we want to call it. All right, whatever we want to call it. Whatever we want to call it. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so we're going to talk about stir-fry, so I don't give a shit. Uh, if, if anybody finds it racist, I agree with you, Brian. We're not talking about karate. Yeah, not this However, week at least. It depends on how you chop your vegetables for stir fry. Mm-hmm. But, uh, so yeah, I recently made some stir fry, and that's why it came up out of Steve's mouth. Um, uh, you know, it was Stephen mentioned something in our, our episode that was like the lazy episode. That was one of our laziest episodes. Every every episode? <laughs> yeah. As, as what, Steve what, leans back and yawns in his chair. Uh, <laughs> which, wait a minute, which one specifically wasn't our lazy episode? <laughs> the hot dog episode was not our lazy episode. We did research for that one. All right, um, all right, all right. But, uh, yeah, he had said something about how stir, uh, stir fry is like a lazy man's meal. And I said, no, because you got to chop up all the vegetables and shit. And it could be a pain in the ass. And Steve just said, like, asparagus. But, like, what are some of the things, like, if you, if you, first off, Brian, have you ever made, like, a stir fry? Nope. Okay. So, <laughs> Eli. <laughs> <laughs> have, uh, yeah, Eli. I made one the other day. <laughs> you made one the other day? Great. I Tell did. us about it. <laughs> well, uh, I got some, uh, some, from fresh snow peas from Hornyak Farms. Ah. And, uh, a little bit, a little bit of flank steak sliced up real thin. Mix in a little soy sauce, a little, little put over a little rice. Some, some delicious stuff. But that was rice. it. Just, just snow peas and steak. And yeah, rice. that's all I had. <laughs> so I didn't have to cut. I didn't have to cut up anything. So cutting it up was not. I threw peas in and I threw steak in. Done. Nice. In, in my experience, um, uh, stir fry tends to be mostly vegetables. Is that not the case? Uh, Whenever yeah. I've had it before, it's mostly. Peas, mostly peas and carrots and onions and peppers and all kinds of stuff. With some yeah. meat mixed in. Yeah, when I used to do it in college, I think that's probably the only way I ever got vegetables was by making yeah. a stir fry. It seems like it's the dish that just that just like calls for vegetables because when you make it that way, it can make even a vegetable that's unappetizing, like peas in a pod. To me, is unappetizing, but it's very good when you stir fry. Yeah. Well, I know, Steve, I know you you, you dig the stir-fry, and uh, you get yeah. into it. I, I, I dig uh, the asparagus shrimp stir-fry. Those, those two ingredients kind of mix it up with, like, soy sauce, like uh, Eli was saying, and maybe a little bit of garlic in there, a little uh, like sambal, maybe, you know, that little chili, the, the not the, the sriracha, but, like, the, the sambal ol- olek. You ever had that? I don't know what you're talking about. It's like... Um, it's like a spicy. Yeah, that's, a good, that's a good stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it's really good. It's, it, you, you'll find a lot of Chinese restaurants and stuff, but uh, yeah, it's like a spicy chili paste that uh, kind of has garlic in it too, and uh, it's good. Nice and tasty. It kicks, kicks it up a little bit, you know? So that's the kind of way I usually do, but we do all kinds of different stir fries. I mean, it's kind of like just fajitas, but <laughs> just Asian, you know? 
Do you do you use yeah, uh, much. rice or noodles or neither or what? Um, I've done everything. I've done uh, rice a lot. I've done zucchini noodles. Uh, that's always good um, with uh, with shrimp and yeah, I, I, that's. Yeah, zucchini noodles are, are pretty awesome because you don't get all weighed down and you're having veggies, but like it tastes like a noodle. I mean, it absorbs the flavor of everything else you're cooking it in, so it's good. When I get stir fry, I take it. I don't make it with rice, but I serve it over rice when it's ready when it comes out. You, you put it on top of the rice. Yeah, when after if it's okay. after when I've had it before, when it's cooked, then it's served over white rice. It's not really <laughs> cooked in the rice. Well, yeah. I think if, if you if you Mix it together with the rice and add the soy sauce. Then it just becomes fried rice, right? I mean, basically. I don't know. Oh, I don't does, know. I don't I mean, know. Doesn't fried line. rice need egg? I, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I make it with egg. I make it with egg too. To me, it needs egg. Well, see, I like the. We're egg, really you know, breaking new ground today. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can we can continue. We can talk uh, other Chinese uh, foods, um, but. Uh, no, I think stir fry. You're, you're right, um, Steve. Like stir fry is kind of like fajitas. Like you know, fry up some vegetables and throw some meat. And that's it. You know. Yeah. But uh, you know, I, I've never done the shrimp. I've always done steak or chicken, or actually venison or chicken. Which I'm wondering, Eli, why didn't you use venison? You had no venison. You got the snow peas. But I, you didn't I get have any venison. I have no venison now. A ten, a ten hour drive with venison doesn't really usually work too well. So, yeah. you know. Does it go bad pretty quickly? <laughs> it might. <laughs> <laughs> you need a cooler, yes. <laughs> okay, the, okay. Dog, the dogs might get into it, I don't know. Okay. Uh. <laughs> you can't just strap the deer to the hood of the car? I thought that's what people do. <laughs> I that's pretty common practice. So, when... When you guys make stir fry, do you, just, do you only like use soy sauce? Like, obviously, like some. I put soy sauce on basic every seasons. I put soy sauce on burgers, steaks, cereal, everything. What, what is the difference between soy sauce and soy milk? Soy <laughs> like, sauce. What's the like, difference? Like, wouldn't it? But like, okay, soy milk. Milk comes from a tit, and a soy doesn't have tits, so. It would be. Hey, was the last time you saw a soy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the yeah, GMO yeah, you soy. Can milk, you can milk anything with nipples, and yes, yeah, soys have nipples. <laughs> I'm just but like, if, if, if you're making so, a sauce out of soy, isn't it the same as making like the soy juice that would be with skinner soy milk? Well, there's soy milk know. isn't I, loaded with salt like soy sauce is. Well, soy sauce is fermented. Ah, thank you, Eli. There it is. There it is. There it is. <laughs> now no. There you go. How, how long have we had this show and we finally learned one thing? Like, that's the first, <laughs> first thing we ever taught anybody. Well, this is the 56th episode, so, you know, it takes a while. <laughs> and is it's it? our guest and I, and I could be wrong. I, I could really be wrong. I may not, not actually know. Let's this. just go with it. <laughs> yeah, it sounds real, so let's just do it. Let's double down. It's definitely fermented. Yeah, and probably because there's no, sugar, there's no sugar in it, it doesn't become alcoholic. There you go. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> Cle- clearly, we all have sugar in us because we become alcoholic. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty pickled right now. But, uh, but no, I was saying about the stir fry being a pain in the ass because like I like to do uh, the carrot. I like to do carrots and I like to cut them in like matchsticks. Carrots so are good. That's a pain in the ass. You know, that's why like, like stir fry. It stir, stir fry is good with a lot of vegetables. Like I joked about it before, but stir fry is perfect for a lot of fucking vegetables. And that's the way to go. Carrots are carrots are super important. I'm a guy who's just meat, 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 meat. But when I do stir fry, give me all yeah, the vegetables are. and then <laughs> the dark meat, and then let me throw in the uh, the chi- some chicken or some uh, some shrimp or some steak. But it's mostly gonna be vegetables, pea pods and carrots and. Peppers and things like that. Yeah, well, I always like to get the, the the water chestnuts and the bamboo shoots, and add those too. Yeah, and like it's the only time large, I eat bamboo, big chunks of garlic, big slices <laughs> of garlic, like even whole garlic cloves. Go great, the giant ones. Okay. 
when you when you guys add uh, protein, like a chicken or pork, uh, to your stir fry, do you, do you coat it in cornstarch? No. Yes. Yeah. You're wrong. Yeah. You're wrong. Yeah. I don't have an answer. I'll, I'll, never, I'll never. How do you do it, Steve? I don't have an answer for that. Yeah, in, in cornstarch. Yeah, it gets that nice little, like, just a little. Well, how do you even explain it? But just a little crunchiness, it, I guess. Like a, it's a almost like a it gives a little, gives a little, it allows it a brown, gives it a little crunchiness, and then it also, when it comes off, it thickens up the sauce a little bit too. So it's kind of battered a little bit. Kind of. A little bit. A little bit. Okay. Right. You don't, don't got to do a heavy coat and just kind of dust it, you know? Like, it doesn't have to be like like a, a, a fried chicken coat, like not, not like that, but, you know, so quick coating, just throw it in there, dredge it real quick, boom. Good stuff. Okay. Sounds okay. good to me. And, I, and back to, you know, you said about the protein, like, and I, again, am just going to continue to harvest. It's not a lazy man's dish because you've got to cut that shit up. Like, you don't, you don't, cook a steak and then cut the steak up and add it to the stir fry. You have to like slice little slivers of steak or chicken or pork or, you know, I mean, shrimp, you can just buy some small shrimp and peel them, but, you know, that's, again, that it takes some time. And uh, it's it's fun. If you're in there, <laughs> the, perfect, the perfect meal to do after you go to a farmer's market. Just yes. go to farmer's market, load up on veggies, and then just figure out what to, to put it all in together. The fresh figure ingredients. Out, way out. Yeah. yeah. Do you guys own like a gi- like a big wok? You guys have a big wok? Uh, yeah. I have a wok, but I don't use my wok for stir fry. Eli, do you have I, a wok? I don't use my wok for anything. Did you get a wok? Really? I don't use it. Did you get a wok from San Francisco? That mom I did. Bought? Yeah. Yeah, my wok. And, and mom said you have to see you have to season it. And and I had no clue what that meant, so it's sitting in my garage. Well, I, I seasoned mine, but it's sitting on my uh, bulkhead, and it's storing other tools that I actually use. So there you yeah. go. I mean, it, the the twelve inch frying pan I have tends to you know do the job exactly. for two people. <laughs> right. <laughs> Because whenever I've had it before, it's when my mom would make it for me, my brother, my dad. Like, make it for, like, four or five people at once. Like, it was always a large amount, so the wok was perfect for that. Like, a stir- regular frying pan was never enough. Like, I think if you made a big, if you made a huge amount, you'd probably need a big old wok. I'm, I'm thinking of getting yeah. one. So. Well, like, recently when I made it, what I ended up doing was I made noodles. And I cooked the noodles in, obviously, a separate pot. And I did all the meat. I did the meat removed the meat, then did all the veggies. Then I added the meat and added the soy sauce and, and whatever and, and just mixed it up. And then I drained the noodles. I ended up putting the noodles back in the pot. And then I threw the meat and veggie mixture on top and added a little bit more soy sauce and then mixed it all together. Because there's no way I could get the noodles in that, that frying pan. The wok, you're right. I would have been able to. But... Mm-hmm. Do you guys ever add anything besides the soy sauce, like something maybe with a little more kick? Is it always soy sauce, or do you, do you switch it up a little bit? So I normally, you know, I'll add a little little splash of uh, uh, sesame oil, some you know, some garlic, some ginger, you know, just give it some, some of that Asian flavors that you kind of think of traditionally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I use ginger. Yeah, green fresh ginger it makes, makes for a good stir fry, for sure. I mean, when I eat it, I always like will throw some sriracha. Like I'll drizzle some sriracha over top. But uh, yeah. yeah, I'm not. Whenever uh, we do something like this, we can always guarantee one of us is going to put sriracha on it. I don't care what it is. We even sriracha even came up during the hot dog episode. Sr- sriracha is good on everything. So man. We need it. We need to start. Sriracha makes me poop. <laughs> <laughs> we need to start hitting up people at sriracha, and we can get some free sriracha shit. Like we got the free King's Hawaiian shit. Yeah, man, that uh, Dana Ryan Chase looked like you hooked her up with some good stuff over there, well, man. She already made some well, ribs. Well, not Eli, but you, you, you and Steve and Skate Rat, I got your packages are ready to go. So, uh, Sweet. They'll be going out this week, so you'll get your, your sauces. Nice. Sweet. Yeah. But, uh, I still have the one you left here, so. Yeah, and you and that, again, yeah, that was a free one, too. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> But uh, why don't we listen to a little bit more punk rock music, and we'll come back and try to figure out what else we want to talk about. All um, right, should I? Uh, can I send it out on this one? Go for it, Brian. All right, this is uh, one of Jughead's bands. Even in blackouts, they're called from Chicago, of course. A song <laughs> called "In a Letter Never Sent." 
on? On Punk Rock Foodies Radio, yeah. Uh, on the uh, internet scene. <laughs> yeah, go. <totally. laughs> from Richmond, Virginia called Municipal Waste with a song called Sadistic Mus- uh, <laughs> Musician. Sadistic Magician. A little thrash metal to change it up here on uh, Punk Rock Foodies Radio. I am Brian Reinhardt and I'm back here with the uh, boys and uh, Steve uh, Guerrero. I'm here. And uh, we're back on Punk Rock Foodies Radio. And we decided that uh, we can't talk about Stir Fry anymore because we're kind of We've kind of we've kind of tapped out that resource. There's nothing else to really say. It's delicious, well, but we've pretty yeah, much covered all the bases. Exactly. So, I prefer noodles over rice. There so you go. What? It's <laughs> done. Yeah. <laughs> I prefer rice over right. noodles. Once again, <laughs> you're wrong, Xander. No, I'm not wrong on this one. Man. 
<laughs> what are you guys drinking? I am drinking an anti-hero IPA from Revolution in Chicago, and I'm sending all you guys one of these for our next beer episode. Hey, I just want I just want some zombie dust. I can get some zombie dust. I, I can get zombie dust pretty. Shit. It's pretty good. It's I mean it's it's yeah, it's good. good. It, it's uh it's to me a little bit overrated, but that doesn't mean it's bad. It just it's not. It's there's better beers. It's just it's hard to get. That's all it is. It's just hard to get. Right. But it, it is very good. It's it's good, and I'll get you guys some. Who who makes that? It just it's it's excellent. Uh, three Floyd's. <laughs> it's what it does is it's zombie dust smells better than most other beers. It's just got this scent that's just amazing. It's one of the first citra hopped beers that they really made in the Midwest. Um, so there's a lot of beers like it now, but it was one of the first that really did the citra hop thing. So I'll get you guys some. I'm drinking Miller Lite. <laughs> That's L I T E. <laughs> yeah, they can't spell. It's punk rock foodies. I feel like we should all be drinking PBRs. <laughs> hey, I, I mowed the lawn. I mowed the lawn today. I got paid for that. I, I picked up a 12 pack Miller Lite. I'm good. <laughs> nice. Dude, I mowed the lawn. You got paid too. in Miller Lite. Uh, no, <laughs> cash. <laughs> and then you use that cash to buy Miller Lite. Yeah, exactly. So essentially, you got paid in Miller Lite. <laughs> Pretty much. And I still have some cash. Nice. <laughs> that's why I went... Oh, don't forget to tip your waiters. <laughs> that's, that's why I went with Miller Lite, because, you know, I want to have some cash left over. No, what are you drinking there, Eli? I'm drinking a wonderful Founders Backwoods Bastard. Oh, that's very good. That's a very good one. I love that. What kind yes. of beer is that? I've never heard that it's a uh, it's out of it's a uh, founders out of Michigan. It's uh, oak age Scotch ale. Oh wow! It's very it's tasty very stuff. strong. What's the ABV on that? It's over ten percent, isn't it? It's uh, I think it is ten. I don't, I don't know what this year's was. Let's see here. It's somewhere on the bottle. It's on there somewhere. It's backwoods bastard is very eleven point six. Yeah, oh, 11. it 11. doesn't. 6 this year. It doesn't mess around. It's a it's a, you said it's a Scotch ale, right? Because it's got that super. Strong, it t- like it just tastes like whiskey beer. I can't stand yeah, scotch. You never have to decide between bourbon and beer again. It's all in one bottle. It's great. Yeah, <laughs> it's, good. It's, good. it's a good compromise. So what I was saying is, what an idea I was thinking. We should have a malt liquor episode where we just drink like Old E and King Cobra and Colt Forty Five, Mickey's. Yeah, Mickey's. For I think sure. that sounds like a Christmas morning episode, Xander. Absolutely, yeah. that's our uh, tradition. That's our, our family tradition. Is. Uh, Drink at 40s on Christmas morning. Oh well, let's make it happen. <laughs> you want to talk? You want to talk about radio? You drink one for our homie Jesus, <laughs> or Jesus for you, Steve. Uh, yes, Jesus, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus Cristo. <laughs> was that our, was that our Mexican moment? Yeah, yeah, maybe. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> hey, uh, this might be Steve. Do they have Jews in uh, in Mexico? <laughs> yes, they have orange Jews and pineapple Jews and. All kinds of Jews. <laughs> I, did, I think. Didn't, I wanted to work that joke in last week and it just didn't come up. So that, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. That was good. <laughs> Uh, Jesus was Jewish, so we all float. <laughs> I think my favorite Jews are definitely apple Jews. Oh yeah. <laughs> and that was our Mexican moment of the day. Don't forget Baba Jews. Jungle Jews. No, but totally. Ball, uh, gets a four, couple forties and just. You know? We could do an episode with Take Edward's 40 hands. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so what is, <laughs> this one tastes like piss of a hooker. Yeah, how's this one? <laughs> <laughs> this one's even worse than last time. <laughs> they do get better the more you drink, though. That's uh, that's one thing about malt liquor. That's true. Yeah, that's once true. you're about halfway through, you're like, oh, I could I could drink this till I die. And it probably shouldn't take, it's cold. It shouldn't take very <laughs> long. And it might happen that evening. Yeah. <laughs> if you stick with it. Like a friend of mine uh, from Florida brought up a bunch of, uh, I don't even, did I talk about it last week with the crunk juice? Did I tell you guys no. about this? My buddy no. Randy came up from Florida and brought these giant tall boy cans of, it's like, a, it just says it's a malt beverage. It's called crunk mm-hmm. juice. I got four flavors. I got uh, lemon, lime, I got cherry, I got watermelon, and uh, I think oh, orange. Yeah. And it's twelve percent. 
ABV. Oh, jeez. Was that like and it's Four like, Loco? It's, that- dude, it, it kind of is. It's super strong and super sugary. And yeah. it's, it's kind of like Mad Dog 2020. When I, I, I've only had, he brought me like 16 of them. Four four what? packs. Four four packs. <laughs> and I've only had one. I've only had one. And I first started drinking, I was like, oh my God, this is the worst thing I've ever had. I've, I don't know if I'm going to finish this. And about 10 minutes later, I was like, ooh, this is delicious. I can't wait to drink more. <laughs> it was like that. Like, like midway through, Let I'm like, oh my something. God. I felt like I had to buy stock in the company. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you something, Brian. Do you have a um, uh, like an asphalt driveway or is it a concrete driveway? It's asphalt. Pour a little of that on your asphalt driveway okay. tonight, and then see what happens in the morning. Dude, here's listen. If it, <laughs> yeah, listen, if it if it damages it. You're gonna have to. You're gonna. Sheena's gonna have to talk to you. I'm blaming no, you. I deal with some Sheena. Kind of, okay, I'm just saying you are. Well, don't gonna put get it the in the middle. Of, don't like pour the whole can out in the middle of your fucking driveway. Yeah, but if, <laughs> even if I put like a little bit in the corner, she's gonna notice. So you know, so you're gonna have to deal with. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. They're alcoholics. They won't notice. Put it on the street in front of your house. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. So what do, what do I what do we think is going to happen? This is my homework. What's, what do you okay, think? Okay, so what happened? Happen? Uh, uh, Eli's and my older brother had bought some. Uh, was that that the tilt, the, the the big cans of tilt? Yeah. And uh, it's a malt beverage, and it's like eleven percent. And he spilled some on his driveway, and it um, ate like a hole through the through the asphalt. Really. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'm interested now. I'll give it a shot. This is an experiment. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, Eli, Eli can confirm what we've talked about. I've talked about my older brother before. He's kind of a douche. Yeah. He may have accidentally, yes. you know, gone out there with a knife and dug a hole and forgot about it, you know, but. I well, mean, in the name of science. Or there always was a, a hole there and he just never noticed. That's Because I'm all about science. <laughs> Yes, do it. In the name of science, just test it out. Just, you know, little... Then, then you'll know what you're doing to your stomach if you actually eat it. Man, bro, Steve, you are exhausted, man. You had a rough time. <laughs> I'm tired. I'm tired. A lot, lot of hail fires were, uh, went down this weekend. Mm. I've done worse to my stomach. That's for sure. Wow. So, um, I had mentioned in the intro that uh, we had uh, Jeff and who had been on uh, Chopped. And Eli, you actually tried out for MasterChef. I before. did. What, um, yeah. what was, uh, can you tell us uh, about the experience of trying out for MasterChef? Um, well, I, uh, I ended up uh, making, making my gumbo, my famous gumbo, which is delicious. And uh, <laughs> went, down, went down to Florida and Stood in line for hours upon hours on end, waiting to go in for them to taste a, the tiniest, tiniest spoonful of the of the sauce, the stock of the gumbo. And I was actually right next to a guy who claimed to be an original Cajun from from the old country. And his gumbo recipe was his family's recipe. And that's what every everybody knows. This recipe this is the best stuff in the world. Well, I got selected to go to the next round. He didn't. <laughs> Uh, so, so some guy, some guy from Pittsburgh got 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 further than a Cajun. <laughs> yeah, because you put um, a little crunk juice in there. Yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs> that was what I did. That was my secret ingredient. <laughs> <laughs> you gave it away, Brian. Shit. Oh man, that's good thing nobody was. So, this shit. how did you know? You were... <laughs> now you were living. Uh, you're living in Myrtle Beach, and when you went down to Florida, so. How did you, like, okay, so you made it the night before? Like, what the fuck? Like, how did this all I stayed with, uh, yeah, I stayed with friends in Tampa. And, uh, I stayed with friends in Tampa, did it there. So, heated, I brought it down cold, cold, I brought, made it at home, cold it down, took it down there, then heated it back up in Tampa, drove to Orlando, and, and, and they just tasted it there. Like I said, the littlest, tiniest bit. I mean, I guess they didn't want the food poisoning, which probably came along with it sitting in the sun for hours. But. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would imagine gumbo in the sun, like, that's just fermenting even more. That's well, they probably also, the, all the shit they got to taste all day. Well, that was probably, probably the special ingredient. That was probably the, what he did pr- properly. That was what made it good, was the, the fermenting. 
Like that put Possibly. it over the top. The, the fermenting like soy sauce. That's yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> the, the, the absolutely, definitely fermented soy sauce that we are absolutely convinced is definitely true, no matter what anyone says. <laughs> okay, so you got selected to go to the second round. And, okay, so obviously the first round is the taste testing. And they, they think, this is good, let's call them back. Second round is feats of strength. And then it's... <laughs> it's I wish it was feats of strength. Of grievances. <laughs> <laughs> so in the second round, what do they do? Measure your penis? Like, what is it? Uh, shit, if, I mean, if that was the case, I would have won the whole damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> Boom, there it is. But, uh, no, that's, the, that's the interview round where, uh, where you stand in a line of a bunch of people and have to tell your story. Okay. And um, unfortunately, the guy next to me was like, he like lost an arm or something in, in, in Afghanistan. And then the girl on the other side of me had cancer when she gave birth to her daughter, who also had cancer and lost an arm in Afghanistan. So it's kind of tell your soft story Jeez. as much as you can, whether it's a real story or not. That's what these. Per- what, are, what is with these forgetful people leaving limbs in Afghanistan? Just keep better track of your limbs, dude. <laughs> this, is, this is laziness. From what I hear, that's like the place where people lose limbs. Like, I yeah, know. If you're going to fly to Afghanistan, get a GPS, attach it to your limbs, yeah. you won't lose them. I lost a limb. Oh, where'd you lose your limb? In Afghanistan. Oh, okay, well, that's where limbs go. Okay, I got you. <laughs> You'd think they'd have a lost and found with just a box of limbs. Yeah. There's like a guy. You know, leave, mail, mail me a 44 long. That's all I need. <laughs> there's, like a, there's, like, there's a guy in Afghanistan with this giant warehouse filled with fucking legs. Legs and arms. <laughs> limbs are us. Dude, dude, we just, we just, dude, we just lost all of our veteran listeners. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so many listeners. Yeah. yeah. It was bound to happen. This is what happens when you put me on the show. Man. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> you okay, Xander? Yeah. Limbs, are, your limbs are us. Man. <laughs> Yeah, we pissed off a bunch of people. Well, like two. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. All right, pull it together. Pull it together. We, they can open up a back, store. Our limbs are us. So. We got them all. <laughs> so your interview is unsuccessful, and yeah, yeah. now you're on this show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How the mighty have fallen. Yeah, God, it's just getting worse for you, man. <laughs> I mean, it was, it, was, it was a rough day and a half. Like, I think I ju- we had just moved... From Pittsburgh to Myrtle Beach, like like the, like two days before, I went. I drove all the way down to Tampa, and then I drive to Orlando, and I think I bought a bag of weed when I was in Tampa, so I was like really high. It just you know it was just a, uh, I, I didn't have much energy by the time I got to the interview round. <laughs> That's my story at least. I clearly have no personality. Well, here's the Im- here's the important part. Was it was it was it good weed? That's the important part. It was. Um, if I recall, it was great something. Okay. I had a I had to wrap it in a lot of dryer sheets to keep my trunk from smelling. Nice. Oh. That still didn't help. It was delicious. <laughs> Have we done an episode on cooking with weed yet? No. We've talked about cooking with beer. But no. Uh, but Eli should definitely be on the episode we do with cooking with weed. Oh, no. Or we could just talk about it now. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> not saying you're not welcome back, but yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. We're, you're here. <laughs> Let's do it now. He's never coming back. Let's be honest, guys. <laughs> Steve, have you ever cooked with weed? Uh, yeah. Let's see. What it? The most decadent thing I can remember doing is we made uh, weed butter once, and we got crab legs, and that was Ooh. that was pretty that was pretty awesome. Damn, <laughs> that's nice. Yeah, yeah you could you could stop eating though. That was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Well, that was a long time, ago, but that was that was good. Eli's made some cookies. Yeah, I made I made uh, chocolate chip cookies with bubble hash. One time, I must say that was the best Christmas ever. Nice. Yeah, he was just like so chill on the recliner. I just yeah, yeah. just sat back on the chair, watched watched your girls open the presents, just 
Just chilled the fuck out. <laughs> Having the time of your life. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, en- I think I enjoyed it more than I did. Oh. <laughs> sure you did. <laughs> Yeah, I, re- I, re- I remember that, that Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't have enough 40s, so I still remember it. All right, well, um, we got uh, Jeff Ang, executive chef of Tower Oaks Lodge in Rockville, Maryland, coming up. Uh, he was, now, I said in the intro that there's like a tie-in. He actually was on Chopped. It was season 11, episode 4. And uh, he was also on, he came back for Chopped Redemption. Season 17, episode 12. So we'll talk to him. We'll talk to him about uh, his experience in Chopped and uh, his uh, background and what have you. And uh, Nice. Uh, yeah. So he's coming up, and um, we're going to send off with a little bit of music. Let's play some jams. Who's up? I'll say let's go with one of my favorite food bands of all time, The Descendants. Do uh, one of their new songs, Victim of Me. Good song, good song. On punk rock foodie, foodies. <laughs> That's one for the blooper reel. <laughs> I thought the whole show was a blooper reel. <laughs> 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 Denver, and you're listening to Punk Rock Foodie Radio.
And that was Values here by Strike Anywhere, and you're listening to Punk Rock Foodies Radio. And with us now is foodie member and chef Jeff Eng. Uh, Jeff, how you doing? Good. Good. Thanks for having me on. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for uh, joining us. Yes, um, so you are the executive chef of Clyde's in Rockville, Maryland. Right, Tower Oaks Lodge, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, there is another Clyde's. There are many Clyde's. Many Clyde's, yeah. Yes. I believe there are now 14 stores in all, including the uh, Old Epic Grill and the Hamilton and uh, a bunch of other places. And being the executive chef, what does that mean? That means it's like it's your menu or you're just well, the guy in charge back there? Yeah, well, you, you are the guy in charge, but it's nice uh, with Clyde's, uh, they add a lot of buying power, so you know that. Um, so they take away a lot of the legwork, like figuring out food costs or on certain items, things like that. But you have the freedom of having freedom with the menu. There's a couple core items that you have to have on there, being the Clyde's restaurant, the crab dip, the wings, the burger. But uh, the rest of the menu, totally up to you, which is cool. That's cool, that's cool. And do you, do you, do you change the menu often? We try and change seasonally, but you know, if we got a, a dog that's not selling, we'll change it on the fly if we have to. What, um... I was going to say, what's your, what is your, like, specialty? I mean, the racist in me wants to say Asian, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the intelligent person in me uh, knows this is an American-style right. restaurant. Absolutely, but, yeah. Uh, we like to call it modern American, I guess. It kind of gives you free reign to do whatever you want. Um, I'm classically French-taught. I went to L'Academy, L'Academy de Cuisine um, way back in 93, uh, 94. Uh, that's when they were still in Bethesda. But... Uh, yeah, so I, I like to take the classics and give them a spin, and sometimes with ingredients, sometimes not. So, um, what prompted you to become a chef? Like, what were you growing up? Did you always want to be a chef, or um, did you get in trouble with the I law? Didn't, well, or? not the law. Well, a little bit, but uh, <laughs> not so much um, knowing what I wanted to do. I did, you know, own a deli. Um, I was working construction. Uh, right after high school and do, doing a little bit of college and uh, I was working construction as a laborer and uh, it was hard work during the summer and my foreman decided that hey man I'm out I'm, I'm done with this uh, I'm going to open a deli I'm like hey that sounds good <laughs> so he's like alright well you got any money you know well you can be an investor and be a part owner so I did that and uh, I think that's kind of where I kind of got the bug for it you know um, my grandfather was a chef um, my mother was always a good cook, so I I was a latchkey kid. I was the first one home all the time, so I would get dinner started instead of doing my homework. <laughs> and then my mom would come home and we'd finish dinner together. So it was kind of like a that was like our thing. And um, you know, owning the deli kind of sh- really kind of opened my eyes to like, hey, you can actually make some money doing this. It's fun. It's yours. And uh, so that's how I kind of got my start. Um, I bounced around for a little while after we. Uh, Sold the deli. We opened another one and sold that one too. So I had a pretty steady income coming in without having to do anything. Nice. Until nice. my dad kicked me out and said, uh, "Hey man, get your shit together. You know, go, you you've got, got a steady income. You got, now. You've got, to, you've got to figure out what you're doing." I said, "Hey, I think I want to go to culinary school. You know, I like. Uh, I think I'm pretty good at it. I, it's in my blood with you know, yeah, my absolutely. grandfather being a chef. So, um, you know, I always grew up cooking. So it's kind of a, a natural progression for me." So you go to culinary school and you get out, and what's your first gig? My first gig's at the 1789, also a Clyde's restaurant. Um, it's their fine dining flagship. So um, I got out of school and I did my externship there, and I was making uh, I think 550 an hour, and I was actually pretty nice. excited that I was actually getting paid because <laughs> uh, it was something that I love to do, and. Um, just worked my way up, and within four years, I became the uh, executive sous chef. So it's a pretty quick rise from line cook to, uh, to chef, and uh, pretty happy. I got to work with a, a lot of great chefs. I got to work under three different executive chefs, all under one roof. Um, so uh, it was, it just, everything kind of fell in line for me. It was nice. What, um, what advice would you give somebody who's thinking about going <laughs> this is always a good one, but probably my biggest piece of advice would be to get in a kitchen and work in a kitchen first. Um, I think with the Food Network and people, you know, kids growing up just watching it and they love it and, you know, 
yeah. they they are it is shell shock when they come in and to their first restaurant and uh, the pace of it, um, you know. Yeah. If you get the wrong chef with a with a bad temper, that you know that that could turn you off too. But uh, that's not me. But. Yeah. Well, speaking of Food Network, you've been on the Food Network a couple of times. A couple um, times, yes. You were on Chopped. I was on Chopped, and I was on Chopped Redemption as well. Uh, great experience. It was a lot of fun. Um, it's filmed up in uh, in New York at, at Chelsea Market, and uh, it was just great exposure. Get get my name out there, and uh, you know it's it's great. Like. Going to a concert or going to a sporting event, and people would walk up to you. Hey, you're that guy from from yeah. uh, Chop. I'm like, yeah, that's me. Um, okay, so when you're doing Chop, obviously you don't know what the ingredients are, but is it is it exactly like it, it's seen on TV? Like you're given the ingredients and go. Absolutely. Like soon as you, the first time you see him is when you open that basket, and time starts right when uh, Ted says so. Um, the whole shoot was a 13 to 14 hour day, so yeah. you can imagine how much of the, the show ends up on the chop, the uh, cutting room floor. <laughs> but uh, it was a great experience; had a lot of fun. I kind of get off on that kind of pressure, I guess. So yeah. um, it was it was a good, you know, TV show for me to be on. Yeah, yeah, because I was always curious because like when you watch something like Master Chef. And they're like, okay, you have to make donuts. Right. Go. And they all start making, like, I would need to do some research on Absolutely. just how are donuts made. Yeah. You know, like, even, you know, I mean, but it's like they always know. So I'm assuming. I do question there's some, how that, because yeah. uh, I, I know that when uh, we were up at uh, Mario Batali's uh, wine store in New York, and uh, the manager's like, oh, you just missed Mario. He was here uh, practicing for, uh, um, what is it, the. Uh, the Japanese show. Oh, Iron Chef. Iron Chef. I was like, practicing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, you got to practice. Yeah. Yes, stay sharp. Um, so you did say that you were on Chop Redemption, which then would mean that you did not win the original Chop. That is correct. I made it and to the dessert round, and the uh, the kiwi and cream got me. Um, oh. So that was that was a, uh, a, a tough blow for me, but they really liked... Um, you know my performance, and uh, decided to bring me back for a redemption episode. How far did you get on that one? Made it to the second round on that oh. one. I think I got a raw deal, but you know it was a lot of fun. It was it was totally worth it. I'd definitely do it again if they asked me back. I would think the redemption one would be a little bit harder because you probably have other chefs that made it to where you yeah, made it. The competition's good. a little bit yeah. stiffer. They've been there before. They know what to expect. Yeah. Um, they throw a couple extra wrinkles in there. They like. I know that when we did our walk for the first time, I knew exactly where the can openers were. And if you, if you remember the show, we were all sharing one can opener because they, they definitely took them and moved them and, or hid them or something. But, uh, yeah, they, they definitely put a couple extra wrinkles in there for you. Nice. <laughs> That's clever. Um, so uh, so when, when did you originally air on Chop? For our listeners, oh, the first one. Oh, geez, that was probably six years ago. Yeah, yeah. I don't know the exact date or the, or the episode, but yeah, it was it was a while ago. Um, I actually got on by accident, which was kind of cool because they were here uh, interviewing my sous chef who had applied for the show. Went to New York, had to cook for a whole panel of judges, had to stand online. You know, they, he had to you know keep calling to see if he got on. Did I get on? Did they get on? And they finally said, yeah. So they came down to video his, you know, that five seconds before. Right. You know, what do you do outside of the restaurant? And they saw me, and the director's like, hey, who's that guy with the mohawk over there? And I was like, uh-oh, you know. I thought they were just going to ask me, you know, is it okay if we film the restaurant, that kind of deal. But uh, she asked, hey, how come we never applied for the show? I'm like, no, I never thought about it. Because I think you'd be great on it. I'm like, what do you mean you think I'd be great? You've never even seen me cook anything. It's the mohawk. That's what she said. She said, you got the look. I'm like, oh, what's the look? She goes, well, you're Asian, first of all. And then you got a mohawk. So I'm like, all right. So I said, if you fast track me through and all, and, and put me on, I said, I'll, I'll definitely be there. And they're like, yeah, well, I'm pretty sure that uh, one of the other contestants is going to be sick. I was like, oh, all right. So you're pretty serious about this. Mm, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What, what is that uh, affirmative action? Uh, yeah, exactly. You got fast track. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we've actually discussed our mohawks in the past. Yeah. Um, so you've got the Asian hair, so it's it seems it seems to be a little it's straighter, obviously. Yeah. Um, do you have difficulty getting it to stand up, or is it? If I have to put it up myself, yeah, in the back I have a little trouble, but my wife is usually 
always there for me to, to help me out. And what, what I've discovered, I, I use two combs. Okay. And I just push the combs ah, together. All right. And okay. like flare it up. And gotcha. Then, then after, it, like, I put gel in and after it hardens, okay. I'll do it with the combs again. Okay. So it kind of separates. Yeah, we use we use gel first, and then as she dries it, she dries it with hairspray. So yeah. The yeah. double the double uh, product technique. Yeah. So you're familiar with the double product yeah, technique Absolutely, as well. yeah. <laughs> and then I've got this cr- my crown in the back really right. that causes me. Yeah. I usually end up shaving the back part <laughs> off if I if I can't get the good cox comb going. I just you know. Gotcha. Um, but um, so uh, so I did ask you know what is, what is what your specialty like what is something that you really enjoy making like even even not at the restaurant maybe at home. I like getting people to eat things that they don't think they're gonna like. So I kind of got to trick them sometimes, you yeah. know. Um, trying to think of a good one that, like, like kind of gets people. Let's, um, I just did a venison neck okay. in, in the crock pot. Right. If you didn't know it was neck, you, yeah, you didn't absolutely. hear it, you never would know. Yeah, something it like that, man. That's, so that, that's what I, I, that I, I really enjoy that. And then people say, oh, my God, that was so great. Why did it take me so long to, to try this? Yeah. So, so that, so. That's always fun. But, yeah, taking classics, give them a twist. Putting an Asian influence on it—that's that's kind of my style. Excellent, excellent. Well, we do love seeing your posts on the on the page. Um, your most recent OCD one. <laughs> <laughs> I trust me, I understand. I'm the right, same way. I know, right? Yeah, well, These kind of go in hand. Like, being a chef and being OCD, those are like perfect for each other. What, what would you say is one of the most difficult things of working in a kitchen? Uh, working in a kitchen is um, making sure that your team is strong. Um, I have five other chefs on my team, and getting them all to kind of work together, um, you know, kind of paddling the same direction with the same goals, and and really kind of be in your eyes when you're not there, so that the restaurant runs just as well as when you're there as when you're not there. Because um, uh, you know you're only as good as as your as your restaurant runs without you there. So that's that's how I feel. You know, it's your name, but. It takes a team to do it. There's no way you can do everything by yourself. So being able to delegate different jobs and different, you know, each each of my chefs are responsible for a different department, and they do the payroll, they do the scheduling, they do um, all that, and it's really my job to just kind of oversee all that. Which happens, so. so recently you did a, um, a camp for kids. I did. That was, uh, well, explain it. Well, it was a, it was a farm-to-table camp. It was uh, at Freudian Creek Nature Center. And um, it was cool. It was their 10 to 12 year old kids. We had about a dozen of them. And uh, we went to a couple farms. We picked some vegetables, picked some some fruit, and yeah, we went to the Maritime Museum in Annapolis. Um, went to my buddy's restaurant, uh, Eastport Kitchen, and just to see a, a small working kitchen. And then uh, I did a. I guess a tasting menu for them at, at the at the school, which was cool. They helped, they all helped me plate up, and that was kind of their favorite part, I think, of of, of the whole uh, camp. Uh, we also um, played chopped here, so it had three nice. teams uh, of kids, and uh, paired them each up with one of my chefs, and uh, they had a little chopped competition, which was fun. And then we all had lunch together here, and uh, week. It, was, it was it was a lot of fun. Uh, I think they learned something. Um, you know, trying to get them involved in you know the food they're eating, and getting them to go to the farmers market, and and uh, just to have fun in the kitchen, and, and you know, don't be scared uh, yeah. of, of big knives and, and, and flames everywhere. <laughs> I think that's I think the biggest thing that people, the biggest mistake people make, is that they're afraid to just experiment and have fun. Right. You know, it's a skate writer said before. There's always another dinner. Absolutely. You know? Right. So, <laughs> yeah. It's not brain surgery. If you mess up, hey, it's yeah. just a bad meal. You, you, you do better the next time. You know. Exactly. Exactly. Well, Jeff, thanks so much um, for, for joining us. Absolutely. Um, had a great time. If you're ever in uh, the Rockville area, Rockville, Maryland, that's in Montgomery County, um, come on over to, uh, was it Twi- Twin Oaks? Tower, Tower Oaks. Oaks. Tower Oaks Lodge. You got it. Uh, Clyde's Tower Oaks Lodge. And uh, check out, it's a beautiful, beautiful restaurant. Menu looks good. Yeah, so is there anything you want to hear as we uh, head out? Uh, yeah, it's Friday, so uh, let's hear uh, 40 Ounces on Repeat by Fiddler. On Punk Rock Foodies Radio. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you.
to thank Steve, Brian, and my little brother Eli for joining us while Skate Rat is on maternity leave. I'd like to thank Chef Jeff Eng of Tower Oaks Lodge in Rockville, Maryland. If you're ever in Rockville, go check it out. Beautiful place, great, great menu. It's awesome. Also, check them out on Chop Season 11, Episode 4, Season 17, Episode 12. You'll recognize him. He's the Asian guy with the mohawk. Uh, I'd like to thank people here at the Vicious Pig Saloon, downtown Mattersville. And for any of your video or graphic needs, check out Burning Rose Studios. And check out Betty Gear on Facebook. And when you're on Facebook, head on over to Punk Rock Foodies. Uh, 4,500 members and growing. It's real simple. Make food, take a picture of your food, post that picture to the page. All right, bone to it, everyone. I mean, what can you do about, what can you say about stir fry? It's a bunch of shit in a pan. <laughs> <laughs>